Guys, welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to the Vitruvian model of genetics. This video is the sequel to the one I released last week. And in that video, I explained that we, I've created a model which is going to allow you to kind of estimate uh, how good your genetics are. There's four different variables, VG being the Vitruvian model of genetics, and F is what we talked about last time. We, you know, we did a whole video pretty much talking about your ability to put on muscle mass. That's it. Doesn't matter about where it goes, what it looks like, just how much raw muscle can you put on your body, your ability to do so, and then we assigned it a numerical score out of 30. The whole formula, by the way, this VG, the whole final score is going to be a nice 100 number. Essentially, at the end of this little mini video series, you'll be able to see out of 100 how good your genetics are. So it's time to move on to today's topic B. We are talking about bone structure. Do you all remember that scene from Terminator 2, which by the way, best movie ever, and if you disagree with me, then you're wrong, where Arnold Schwarzenegger has to prove to that whatever, what's his name, that he's like a machine from the future. So he took a knife and he like cut off a portion of his arm, like the fleshy muscle part, and he just tossed it away, unveiling like his robot hand, which was like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And that's, that's interesting because it kind of applies here because you can have all this muscle, you could train, you could eat, you can build everything, but at the end of the day, what it sits on, that is really important. Think of it this way. You are hungry, so you get a pizza. And you know, you load up chicken, bacon, all these good toppings. You spend like 40 bucks on toppings, it's gonna be so good, and that's great. But at the end of the day, if you ordered a small, bitch, you're gonna be hungry. That is what we're talking about today. Bone structure is inherently important because no matter how much muscle mass you try to put on, it's all going to go on a certain frame, and you will have that for the rest of your life. Now, the, what I really like about this topic today, when we were talking about fat-free mass and we are talking about muscle, it was very difficult because it's kind of hard when I'm using examples of individuals in the industry uh, who are, you know, they're, they're on something. They're taking gear, they're taking, taking some kind of performance-enhancing drug. Because if I throw it on screen, you might go like, why are you using him as an example when that's not natural? And you're right. And the second issue with that is because we can't really look at your fat-free mass, your ability to put on muscle mass, if you aren't actually somewhat closer towards being experienced, if you haven't put a few years into training and nutrition and all that stuff. Because if you're in your first year, we can't analyze your genetics because we don't know. You have to, the closer you are to your genetic potential, the more and more accurate our estimation is going to be. Both of those problems are solved today. The whole thing about using performance enhancing drugs, you can take all the steroids you want in the world. It's not actually going to expand your skeleton. If you take a certain drug, it could make you know, your biceps bigger, it can make you put on 10 pounds of lean body mass, but it's not actually going to shrink your pelvis, make your clavicles wider, change your rib structure. Those things are set for life no matter what you do. And the other cool thing about it is that although you can kind of train and make yourself wider, do all these things, you can you know, train your lateral deltoids to give you more of that V taper, there are certain things you can do. It doesn't really matter whether you have been training for 10 years or 10 months. So this technically you'll be able to analyze at the end of this video, anybody out there will be able to apply what I'm using and give yourself kind of a score as to how good your bone structure is, whether you're a beginner or not, because you can train for years. Like I said, you can't, ch you can't change your bone structure. So that's why this video is going to be really cool today because it applies to everyone, regardless of whether you're natural, not natural. I can use any example I want because we are looking at your bone structure and nothing else. But guys, before I jump too far into this, I need to just, uh, Walk over here and uh, you know take a look at my research. Let me just. Oh, what's that? Oh, these. Well, I'm glad you asked. Sponsor of today's video. Sponsor of my channel, actually in general. Legend London Jeans. You guys know them. I've talked about them multiple times, but really, I gotta say they are definitely one of my favorite sponsors. Other companies kind of approach me and they say they want to work with me, and sometimes I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. But them. I'm like, hell yeah. One of the coolest thing about them is the fact that I've actually had the exact same pair since back in Australia when I was like 175 pounds. Since then, I've put on a good 20, 25 pounds muscle and fat. I've gotten a lot bigger. Everything else I've had to, I pretty much have like two different wardrobes, one for the summer, one for the winter because I put on so much size. And these, not a problem because there's such a good amount of stretch to them, especially on the calf region because my, just so massive, you know, like I just, I really need a lot of stretch for my 20, 22 inch calves. If you guys are interested, as always, there's a link down in the description box below. But uh, back to the science. Now, there are like 200 and 
something bones in your body. So this topic could be, it can go on forever. But there are four separate areas which I want to focus on, which really, in my personal opinion, in my experience, it can give you a pretty good idea of how good your bone structure is. The four variables we are going to be focusing on today with regards to bone structure are Shoulder width, waist height, and the overall size of your frame, specifically relating to your ankles and your wrist thickness. First things first, shoulder width. This one, I remember when I was a kid, and uh, one of my favorite TV shows was, you guys ever watched that old school Justice League? Strong man as strong as alone. You ever heard that? By the That's not a saying. No, not this piece of crap. This movie was not good. And if you don't want to take my word for it, look at this sad bastard. He knows this movie sucked. The animated series with Superman, Batman, all that stuff. I love that show. And there was one thing which I noticed when I was a kid, it was kind of funny. I'm like, uh, they're all freaks. That's not what people look like. In the case of Superman, his shoulders are in different area codes. I understand the reasoning behind that because it was pretty much an over-exaggeration of, you know, this ideal, like, heroic physique because, you know, visually you want to be like the ultimate, you know, physique, whether it be male, men or women. Wonder Woman had the same thing going for her. She was pretty damn jacked. And one of the things they did is they had extremely wide shoulders and it had a really big V taper. So when it comes to your shoulder width, this is something that unfortunately most of us, you know, we, we can build up our deltoids, we can make it a little bit better, but we can never really change it because this is due to your bone structure. Specifically, we are talking about your shoulder girdle, which is the fancy way of saying the bones responsible for actually attaching and keeping your arm on your body. The two bones responsible for this are your clavicles and your scapula. So how long your clavicles are and how far out your shoulders go, that you can't really train that to happen. You can get bigger muscles, we can't get bigger bones. But essentially, that is due to your genetics. And you know, after high school, once you stop developing and you stop growing, you're kind of stuck with that for the rest of your life. A few examples of what I'm talking about would be someone like uh, Michael Phelps, uh, someone like Captain America, Chris Evans. Although, I gotta be honest, I'm pretty sure, you know, in that costume, there's something going on there. There's like a solid one or two inches of padding because sometimes in some of the scenes, he's so wide, I think he's gonna have like trouble like fitting through doors. So, you know, I, th I think they're, they're boosting up his image a little bit. Another really good example, this is probably the best example I've ever seen, is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I found this photo um, when he was 15 years old. It's ridiculous. Like his shoulders are like out to here, and then his waist is here. And literally, the ratio of his shoulders to his waist is like two to one. That is crazy. And obviously, as he grew up, he really filled out that frame quite well. Now, that being said, a lot of you guys may be watching this and you're thinking like, Igor, you know, you're, you're destroying my dreams because if I wasn't fortunate enough to be built with this, you know, amazing bone structure, am I screwed? And the answer is no. Those people, they're kind of lucky, but it's, it's not the end of the world. A really good example of this would be someone like Callum Von Moger. I don't know if you guys who know who that is. I'm gonna throw it up on screen. He's a popular bodybuilder. He's really got a good physique that really looks like something, you know, the mid 70s, uh, someone like you know Arnold or Franco Colombo, one of those classic bodybuilders. So you guys may be thinking, Igor, this is a terrible example. The guy's got such a good physique. Like, what are you talking about? And the answer to that is obviously yes. However, if you were to actually look at his physique when he was a bit younger, when he was a teenager, you know, take all that muscle that he built, take it off his frame, what do we actually see? And you'll notice that he's a bit of a taller and a bit more of like, not really a V, but kind of like a, a lankier uh, rectangular frame. He doesn't have the widest clavicles. So this is a good example of someone who when they were young, you know, they didn't have this amazing bone structure where their shoulders are like two feet out. He was able to build um, his frame to the best that it could be. But enough about shoulders, okay, you guys get it, it's important. Although it is, it's half the equation. On the other side, equally as important is your waist. And specifically, we are talking about your pelvis. Individuals who have a wider pelvis are most likely going to have a somewhat of a wider waist, and that is going to take away from the V taper. So it's kind of like one improves it, wider shoulders, wider clavicles is going to improve the V taper, and then unfortunately, a wider waist is going to take away from that. If you guys want some examples, a few cool old school bodybuilders would be someone like Frank Zane, uh, Mr. Olympia from 1977 to 1979. This guy was known for not being the biggest guy on stage. He's only like 185 pounds, somewhere around five foot nine. So comparing him to someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger at 235 and six foot two, it's interesting because this guy still, you know, he placed extremely well and he even won the biggest competition in the world three times because he had such an aesthetically pleasing physique. And somewhat, you know, a good part, part of that was due to his training strategy, but also I gotta be honest, a good part of that was also due to his genetics. Another example would be
be someone like Brian Buchanan, another bodybuilder from the 1980s. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. For someone to be that big in terms of muscle mass at a relatively average height and to have that tiny of a waist, it's, it's ridiculous. That is a genetic marvel. Okay, so we've established what we were looking for, but that is not the purpose of this video and this video series. We can see what good or bad genetics are, but how can we give a score? How, how can we quantitatively analyze this? So what we're going to do is, as you can tell here, this is the average physique. You know, this is a guy with average shoulders, average clavicles, average everything. This is an example of someone who isn't really gift that gifted. In fact, this is somewhat not the best genetics. And this is an example of someone with, you know, definitely superior genetics, wider clavicles, wider shoulders, very small hips, very small waist. So let's look at some kind of number to quantify this. If we were to get his shoulder measurement, pretty much if we're going to take, you know, go into Photoshop, draw a line across the shoulders, count the pixels, do the same for the waist. We can actually calculate something which is called the shoulder to waist ratio, literally. Count the pixels on the shoulder, count the pixels on the waist, divide the two, and we get a shoulder to waist ratio. And this is what we're going to be using to quantify mathematically how good someone's uh, V taper genetics are. And we can actually establish a score. I've done so here. You know, it's zero to 10. And uh, as you increase your shoulder to waist ratio, you increase your score with the average being somewhere in that 1.6, maybe 1.7 uh, range. So without further ado, let's jump into a few examples. First on the docket, we have Chris Hemsworth, uh, the actor who played Thor. Uh, I believe this screenshot is from the first Thor movie. And for the record, all these examples I'm going to be using, guys, it's, you know, bear with me. It's kind of hard to find an example of an actor or whatnot where they're standing, uh, you know, even shirtless and they're just facing camera perfectly, you know, they're not twisting their body or whatnot. So if we were to draw a line across his shoulders, repeat the same process for his waist and divide the two numbers, we get to a shoulder to waist ratio for Thor uh, coming out to 1.71, which is pretty good. According to our score system, that comes out to a six, which is above average. And you know, that's good. Obviously you can tell there's a clearly uh, visually prominent V taper. And I would hope so if you were gonna play Thor pretty much like you know, the most kick-ass, like it's pretty much the Superman equivalent in the Marvel Universe. So definitely a good physique, a good example of that. Next up, we got Hugh Jackman again. Not, you know, it's, a, it's an okay photo, but he's a little bent over. He's a little twisted sideways. So bear with me, but we'll still give this a shot. Uh, if you were to repeat the calculations, get his shoulder measurement, get his waist measurement. This comes out to a shoulder to waist ratio of 1.70. Very close to Chris Hemsworth. Once again, coming out to a score of six. So as you can tell, guys, you know, these, these actors who are playing superheroes definitely have to have somewhat at least, you know, above average. Uh, v tapers in regards to their physiques. Next up, we got Superman. This is Henry Cavill from uh, Man of Steel a few years ago. Uh, his shoulder to waist ratio comes out to 1.75, which is again above average score. The, you know, it, give or take, it's kind of a range, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give him a score of seven. So these guys, they look good, and not surprisingly, if you're playing a superhero, you better have at least an above average physique. However, they are actors. They are not bodybuilders. They are not meant to be like just crazy physiques. If you want to see someone who's an example of just something which is ludicrous, genetically speaking, and in terms of his training experience, everything, you've got uh, David Laid, another fitness YouTuber right here on YouTube. If you were to repeat the measurements, take his shoulder width, uh, divide this by his waist, it comes out to, I am not kidding guys, a shoulder to waist ratio, at least in this photo, of 2.02, .02, which is easily a perfect 10 score. I mean, just in terms of his bone structure, this is one of the most ridiculous things uh, yeah, that I have ever seen. However, if you want to see someone who unfortunately probably wasn't gifted with the best genetics, at least in terms of his shoulder to waist ratio in the V taper, you've got Vin Diesel um, from the Fast and the Furious uh, movie series. Uh, if you were to get his shoulders, get his waist, uh, his shoulders actually, they're not, they're not like narrow by any means. He's got, you know, a decently wide physique. However, his waist is a bit wider in terms of his pelvis and, uh, and whatnot. And it comes out to a shoulder to waist ratio of 1.56, which is a score of two. So definitely not the best. And in fact, I, I would say that uh, for someone who does have a few years of training is probably a little bit uh, below average. But again, it's not his fault. It's just, you know, when you have got, when you've got that wide waist, that wide pelvis, there's not much you can do against it. But guys, fine. Okay, I can, you know, I can talk the talk, but can I walk the walk? Let's do an example of myself. This is a photo of me, I believe from June. Uh, at my, at definitely one of my leanest points. I think I was at least, you know, 10% body fat or below. My shoulder to waist ratio comes out to 1.74, coming out to a score of six, which rivals, you know, the other guys from the superhero movies, which I'm, I'm pretty happy with. However, one thing I do have to, I do have to mention is that although my shoulder to waist ratio is not bad, 
my body is a little interesting because my waist is, is relatively thin and relatively narrow. However, my pelvis, my hips, which is a separate measurement, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty wide. And I wanted to show you guys this because sometimes people say like, you know, if you want to, you know, you want to have a, a slimmer waist, a slimmer midsection, you just need to diet down. And this is an example of me clearly dieted down with a clearly visible six pack serratus, you know, a good uh, body fat level. And yet my hips are still pretty wide because you can't diet away a pelvis. That's your bone structure. You can't lose this via diet and exercise. The only way you can do this is if you get surgery, ask the guy to go in there and file down your pelvis, your actual bone structure. And obviously that's, uh, that's not going to happen. So getting back to our B score, because B score is going to be total out of 20 points, uh, I've assigned that these two are going to come together, and that's what the, f what the fuck is that? Every time, every damn time, this is going to be a total of 10, and these two are going to be 5. So next up is height. This one, I'll be honest, right off the bat, I just want to clarify, is going to be very subjective. One thing which I've always found interesting, I went to... Uh, the history of the Mr. Olympia competition. The Mr. Olympia is like the Super Bowl of bodybuilding, pretty much the best bodybuilder on the face of the earth every year. And since 1965, we have had 13 champions, 13 different men have won this competition. And in that entire time, only one has ever been over six feet tall, Arnold Schwarzenegger. On the other hand, we've actually had four champions who are 5'7 or under. I think it was 5'5, five, 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 two guys at 5'6, one guy at 5'7. So this kind of tells me like, it, it's interesting, but in your ability, to put on muscle mass and build the ultimate body, it seems there is a bit of a shift, there is a bit of a predisposition to shorter guys. If you guys want some examples in our fitness industry, you've got Matt Ogus and Jeff Nipper, two other uh, YouTube fitness uh, personalities. And I believe Matt Ogus is like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, something like that, and Jeff Nippert is about 5'5". Five, five. So both, you know, somewhat under the national height average. However, they both built incredible physiques, and not, in addition to their training and everything, I do think that just being a little bit shorter, they really, it's almost like they build just these, the only way I can describe it is just stacked, just thick, wide, stacked physiques. On the other hand, if you want to look at someone who might be a little bit taller, you've got someone like Student Aesthetics. Uh, I think he's about 6'1", maybe 6'2", and he's a big dude, don't get me wrong. I've sat next to him, I've trained with him, he's a pretty damn big guy. However, if you were to compare these individuals, uh, student aesthetics, because of his longer stature, it definitely give, does give him a bit more of a elongated physique, and I think that he's had to work a little bit harder uh, to put on muscle on his frame, as opposed to if he was like 5'9", for example. This is why height it's kind of difficult because some people out there, they would much rather be taller. Maybe it's a little bit harder to put on muscle mass, but they don't care. If I can build a quality physique on a six foot two frame, you're gonna look awesome. So this is why height is a very subjective score. This I'm gonna leave completely up to the user whenever they're doing this. If they are happy with their height and they think that they are the best height in terms of combination of being able to put on muscle mass and you know height aesthetics or whatever, give it a five out of five. I'll leave it up to the user's discretion. Finally, ankles and wrists. However, we're not just talking about that. We are discussing overall your frame size in terms of your overall bone structure. How thick are your bones? How big is your overall bone structure? An interesting example of this, there was a, a researcher, a fitness and exercise and nutrition researcher named Francis Holloway, and he actually looked at data and uh, examples of athletes from all kinds of sports, judo, rugby, you know, whatever, you name it. And he found that in the case of men, there is about a five to one ratio in terms of muscle mass to skeletal mass, skeletal frame. So for every one kilo or one pound more of bone mass you have, that is gonna to correlate to five pounds more of muscle mass. And this is a pretty, this is a pretty big deal. By the way, uh, for women, that ratio was four to one. But the reason I'm using ankles and wrists is because this is a very good way to estimate this. Again, guys, the whole point of this thing that I'm making here is because genetics is such a wishy-washy subjective term, and I want it, to the best of my ability, to really kind of give it a score, just, just for fun, to really be able to quantify these things. And there was a really good example using ankles and wrist measurements. So there was a scientist named Casey Button. What he did is he pretty much looked at a lot of data concerning um, bodybuilders from like the golden old school age of bodybuilding. We're talking like Mr. Universe winners from like the 40s and 50s, Mr. America winners, you know, all those guys. And he pretty much, he measured their ankles and wrists and he got the measurements of all this stuff. And he pretty much tried to figure out a way that he can, you know, estimate based on how big your ankles and wrists are, your height, uh, your estimated body fat percentage. And he, 
estimate what your maximum muscle potential is in terms of lean body mass based on these things. So you can actually go, I'm gonna leave a link down in the description box below, you can actually go to this website where you put your numbers in. In my case, uh, 72 inches, six feet tall, estimated body fat percentage of right now, it's probably like something around like 15%. Not fat, not lean, just you know, just the regular average healthy dude. And uh, my wrists are 6.8 inches in circumference, my ankles are 8.6, if I remember correctly, maybe it was 8.5, I can't remember. And uh, this came out to my maximum muscle potential at 15% body fat to be around 219 pounds. But I gotta be honest, I mean, that's, this is just one source, and I do think that that's a bit high, because 219 pounds at a reasonable body fat percentage for me, that's a lot. That's like me still being able to put on 20 pounds of lean body mass on top of my frame, which I have right now. I honestly think in my opinion, I may have like another four, five, six pounds of muscle mass that I couldn't put on. Again, I've been training for over 12 years, but again, this is just a cool way of looking at it. So this all makes sense so far. Obviously your muscle size is gonna be correlated somewhat to your overall bone structure in your frame, but you know, what is a big, ankle or a small ankle or wrist or whatnot. Well, fortunately, there was an excellent report published by the United States Marine Corps back in 1995, where they essentially looked at hundreds or even like thousands of, of individuals, and they were able to quantify and put into percentiles uh, the individuals based on their uh, ankle and wrist circumference. So that is what we're going to be using for this uh, video. In this example, anything with like, uh, you know, under an 8.14 inch ankle circumference, that is going to be in the bottom 10 percentile, and that's going to give you a score of zero because you have pretty small ankles, unfortunately. Someone with uh, ankle size uh, over 8.14, but under 8.36 will be in the bottom 20th percentile, they get a score of one, and so on and so forth. So let's jump into example with myself. Like I said earlier, my wrist is about 6.86 inches. This puts me somewhere in the middle, just over 6.79, but under 6.95, probably somewhere in that 50th percentile. And between two and three, I'm just gonna give myself a nice and easy score of 2.5 out of five which really makes sense because I've always felt that my bone structure is not bad not good relatively average and now the numbers back it up uh, let's repeat the process for the ankles where I have about an 8.6 inch uh, ankle circumference this is once again somewhere in the middle a little bit actually it's a little bit lower it's towards that 40th percentile I guess they're a little bit under average so on the ankles I'm gonna give myself a score of two out of five now because this overall uh, frame size portion of the equation is only out of five we're gonna get the average of this so 2 plus 2.5 sum it up it's gonna be 4.5 divide that by 2 and we get 2.25 that is going to be my final component to the B score. We've created three numbers so far, so finally it's time to combine it all together. All right guys, so we have reached the end. It's time for the best part, the piece de resistance. It's time to calculate our final B score. So if you guys remember earlier in the video, we calculated my shoulder to waist ratio, we assigned a score, and this came out to a not bad, above average, but not incredible, six out of 10. Next up, height. So this one, again, very subjective, but in my opinion, I'm pretty happy with my height. I've always felt that at around six feet tall, you're at a good combination where you're not too tall that it's inherently difficult for you to put on muscle mass, but at the same time, you're tall enough that if you do put on that muscle mass, you look, you look pretty good, you look pretty aesthetic. Uh, so in my opinion, height, I'm very happy with. I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it actually a perfect five out of five. Hashtag love your body, which is very interesting considering we are analyzing and giving ourselves scores. But in this case, love your body. Um, and when it comes to my frame size, as we did in the example, this comes out to 2.25. So congratulations, Igor. You come out to a finale of 13.25, just you know, call an even 13 out of 20. And that, guys, is my example. That is my B score. So if we can combine that, remember in the previous video, we actually did a calculation. My FFMI was around like 22. This came out to an F score of 15 out of 30. Now combined with my brand new B score, 13. So far, my Vitruvian genetic model potential is 28. Although we're not done, guys. We still have two more variables, which we're going to cover in the next video. All right, guys, that is it. That is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, leave it a like. If you learned something new, definitely leave it a like. 
And stay tuned for the sequel. We're gonna wrap this bad boy up. I am so I'm so friggin' excited because we keep on building up to it for the you know the, the surprising season finale. If you guys have not seen the prequel, the first part of this installment, check that out and leave the video down in the description box below. But until then, I'll see you guys in the next video.